it is 30 June 2021 and this is the GM familiarization video for the Torg game system the official Torg game system on Foundry VTT that was uh, made by my, my friends and I um, the player familiarization video I shot and posted a few weeks ago was about tips for players on how to use the system, but not terribly in-depth when it came to the things you game masters need to know to make it all work well. There are a lot of folks coming over to Foundry Virtual Tabletop and, uh, from within the Torg community, both players and GMs from other tabletops, whether virtual or actual, and GMs need to know more about how to set up and run the system. I'm not going to get into all of the hullabaloo about if it's better to play on a virtual tabletop or a real tabletop or anything like that. I have my own uh, designs and prospects about that, and I'm, I don't think I need to get into it here. There are just all manner of arguments that can be said for both, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, it's just, it can be kind of difficult to find good stalwart friends who want to come over to the house and drink drink dew and eat za and, and chill out together. So, but for those of us who, who want to get together with folks online or offline or however best we can do it, Foundry Virtual Tabletop probably offers the best platform to be able to do it. And uh, for the sake of reference and full disclosure, I do not run a special server, but rather am hosted on the Forge. So I won't be sharing any special server tips or tricks today. For any information on other server and hosting types, you'll have to perform some more research on your own. Now Matt, at the Encounter Library on YouTube, uh, not only is he a, a, now a part of the Foundry Virtual Tabletop team, but he, is an, um, he has an amazing resource in the Encounter Library for these things. Alright, finally I had intended to unload Foundry 0.7.9, going through all of my compendium reference material and discarding old information, but that was turning into a pretty daunting task. This was going to be done because the folks at Foundry hadn't found a way to upgrade to the 0.8 plus version of their software yet. Thus, I was waiting until I had more time so that I could shoot this video myself. Well, Atropos and his gang at Foundry, and Kakaroto and his gang at the Forge, found a way to upgrade without having to get silly with it in the Forge. So, I've upgraded from... Uh, the 0.7.10 actually to 0.8.8 just last night. Let's go ahead and get into it starting with the basics. Uh, which browser is best to use? There's no solid answer for this. Let's just start out with that. Foundry was built on Google Chrome as a base for its programming. But I've heard some folks have an easier time with a browser of their choice than they do with Chrome or with uh, any of the other browsers that are out there frankly. I've heard arguments that some people prefer to use Edge and some and, and, and works better for them for their system and da 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 da. Well, it depends on how your computer is physically set up and if you have any programs loaded that might interfere with your browser honestly. You'll have to find these out for yourself but all problems can be overcome. There's an amazing community for Foundry VTT on both Facebook and Discord and for those of you on the Forge like me you can find an outstanding group there as well. See links provided in the description for this video. Perhaps the largest and most active community to go with however is on Discord. In your Discord you should be able to perform a search for servers. Just type in Foundry VTT and you should be taken right to it and you can join from there or you can request access or whatever. The community on Facebook is also very active and large. Response times for questions offered to the excellent developers and moderators of both places, not to mention a completely reactive and respectful community, are pretty low, so you should be able to get an answer pretty quickly. You can have an answer within 15 minutes typically, if not less. However, it's always best to perform your own research on a topic that you're attempting to address um, if you can figure out the keywords you need for your search. All right, back to browsers. For me, I use Chrome. Not because it is uh, best for Foundry um, or that Foundry was based off of the design of Chrome. 
but because I found that the um, uh, the performance issues are much less on Chrome than they are on my most favorite browser, which is Firefox. Now, I know some of you are like, ooh, Firefox. Ew, I don't like Firefox. I'm not going to deal with that. Well, I fell in love with Firefox two decades ago, and I use it for everything other than the Tor game system, as nearly everything put into the system is built around being displayed and used more effectively, for me at least, on Chrome. But everything else that I do seems to work better on Firefox. Now, it's not to say that other browsers won't work with it. Okay, all of them do. But it is to say my best performance for the Tor game system is found in Chrome. Some experimentation on your part with your favorite browser and some others will bring your satisfaction level up, I'm sure. Just experiment around. You may find that a browser that you hated... Uh, actually turns out to be the best for running the game on. So suck it up, drive on, enjoy the game, and uh, go from there. Loading the system up. This can be uh, kind of a difficult thing. Um, but it's... it's. Um, I will tell you that Matt and Nork and uh, uh, Orome and all of the guys that I've worked with to help bring this system forward... Um, have done everything in their power to make it as sweet as they possibly can, as easy as it can get. Um, there's always more requests for making things easier in the system, um, and there always will be, but these guys have really done some magic with this, quite frankly. Okay, The system available to use for your Tor game, unless you intend to build your own, will be the official Tor game system um, sanctioned by uh, Ulysses Spiele, the producers of the Torg role-playing game. Okay, this game was created by my friends. Um, I kind of took a team lead position early on, and I was able to grab hold of of uh, Matt Ritchie's attention. Uh, he is also known on Roll Twenty as GM Matt, and and built the original Torg character sheet for Torg Eternity there several years ago and is is just he is an amazing human being he works really really hard um, <laughs> and he's done everything in his power to bring to life Torg Eternity in, in Foundry VTT in a way that you cannot find anywhere else um, for, for Matt and Erwan and Orome and uh um, Manuel, and for all of the guys that have put in so much work to this system, thank you so much. You are just amazing folks. All right, so let's see. Uh, they've spent many man hours building it to a level of functionality and beauty. I think any other team might be hard pressed to emulate, let alone exceed. Uh, you have to have a system installed in Foundry. Before you can build a world, you have to have a system installed. Okay, now, it's the same thing as a regular role-playing game. Um, in any tabletop role-playing game that you get, you might have a description for the world, and you might have um, the, the basic background of it and everything like that, but until you have actually read through the game system to find out how it's supposed to work and how the world is supposed to function around that framework... You're, you're, you just don't have a game, period. Okay, well, it's the same thing with, uh, with Foundry VTT, and I believe uh, Atropos and his crew uh, you know, developed it this way on purpose. You build the framework, which in this case is the game system, which for our purposes for this video, uh, turn out to be the Torg game system. Okay, and then you actually build your world within and on top of that. Now, if you buy any of the books, like the Core Rulebook, which is available, Finiverse Exchange on DriveThruRPG, which you can then get a code for it uh, to be redeemed on the Foundry VTT website, and then you can get it loaded into your system, um, uh, or any of the three adventures that are presently available. I don't remember their names off the top of my head. Um, and the, all of the adventures and material that are coming forward, you can put all of that information into your game and build your game around it. 
and and then begin to play just like when you're at a tabletop okay um, now learning how to use all of the different assets and stuff like that that can be kind of daunting but uh, maybe I can run you through a little bit of that a little bit later you have to have a system installed before you can build a world to go with it which is why I'm talking about the system first as I'm filming this, the most current official system version for Torg Eternity is 1.1.1, which was released yesterday uh, evening, uh, and it's live on Foundry now, okay, and updates and improvements are rapidly being developed for it. The unofficial card system is what's known as a dependency, and it, it comes with the Torg game system. Torg game system is dependent upon the unofficial card system if you want to be able to run the cards. This means the UCS is necessary and has been made available as part of the Torg game system installation to run Torg Eternity. GMs can, of course, ignore the cards, uh, but they're fantastic to have and to lend dynamics to the game never before seen. Uh, even in original Torg, the cards, um, as, as nice as they were, the 150 card deck that you got, it only pointed out certain things and it gave you certain bonuses and stuff like that. In the case of Torg Eternity, the, the cards are, in my estimation, absolutely essential. Now, having installed the most up-to-date information for use just last night... I will tell you, it's a functional system. It works nice. Um, you can go back to my other video at, I believe it's 5 minutes and 56 seconds for players, and that helps you start to kind of understand how to use the cards. Uh, your players do not have to be uh, GMs or co-GMs or anything like that. However, you may have to manipulate some of the cards. Now, Nork has been going through and and kind of rebuilding the system in anticipation of the official card system, which I'll get to here in a minute. Um, but uh, there, he may not have time to get all of that done so that permissions and whatnot are in a better condition before the official card system is released for Foundry VTT. Again, hang on. On installing uh, Torg, the uh, unofficial card system is also automatically installed, including a standard 54 card deck and the basic drama, destiny, and Cosm decks from the Torg RPG. Once you have Torg and the unofficial card system loaded, it's not difficult to learn how to load up any digital cards you have purchased for Torg Eternity during any of the numerous crowdfunding campaigns you've pledged in or that you've purchased since from Foundry VTT. Okay, for all of the new material that is getting ready to start coming to Foundry for the sake of running Torg full time. All right, so let's talk about the unofficial card system for a few minutes. Um, as of this recording, the official card support for Foundry VTT has recently been voted highest priority for the next big thing to go into Foundry. Now, um, Foundry VTT has a Patreon page, and anybody who is a Patreon can go and vote on what is most important, okay, for, for the next, uh, thing to be done, the next cool thing, Okay. Now I understand that the the card voting was put in by the by a pretty wide margin. Now that's not just because of Torg Eternity, but it's also for for like Savage Worlds and for Settlers of Catan and for various other games that are out there that are important. Um, that certainly games like the World of Warcraft collectible card game, uh, Star Trek. Uh, CCG, TCG, whatever, Battletech, TCG, all of those will eventually have a home on Foundry VTT because of the official card system that is, is coming into place. Don't quote me on this. I don't know how in-depth that card system is going to become, but I think it's probably going to be pretty neat. Anyway, that was voted widest, uh, highest priority by a wide margin. This card support is set to come in version 0 0.9, and it's 0.8.8 right now, but we're still not expecting it before probably the uh, the end of the year. I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, so it might be just around the corner to get that official card support, but don't count on it. 
okay it might be the end of 2021 before we see it or even the beginning of 22. Now my friend Nork is on the de development team working to bring all of this to fruition and it sounds like great things are coming. Will the official card system cover every possibility that can take place in Torg or any other game for that matter? I'm afraid I'm skeptical. Uh, it's going to be really difficult to get new things together um, uh, that won't bump heads with other portions of the official module. But I know that Atropos and Kakaroto and all of the guys who are working on Foundry VTT are brilliant. Um, they have given us a, a virtual tabletop that is out of this world. So if anybody can figure it out, they can. Uh, so if you've seen what's been done through unofficial card support and the Foundry since its inception, then you've seen miracles. And I'm not kidding about that. Well, let's see. For much of the information concerning the unofficial card system, take a look at my player familiarization video beginning at 5 minutes and 56 seconds. I covered that a few minutes ago. Um, we're going to go up to uh, my setup, and I'm going to show you some things about the, universe, or the unofficial card system that uh, will help you out for the time being. And let's... Uh, Let's see if I can show you some good things. Now, bear in mind, I've got uh, 0.8.8 for Foundry VTT. I've got version 1.1.1 for um, for uh, the Tor game system loaded. Everything's in here. This is this is the most beautiful setup I could have asked for. I'm telling you. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and take it off pause. Now, I've got a special setup up here uh, called Card Pools. And I, I made this for myself as something to uh, of a stopgap measure to help make things work a little bit more easily. Okay, so here's the deal. We're going to start off with uh, what you need to know about setting permissions. So we're going to go over here to the upper right to game settings. And we need to go to, I believe it's configure settings, module settings. Okay, we don't want... We don't want about face, we want card support official. So, deck settings for players, okay? What we do is when we pop open the deck settings for players, you've got your various decks listed here, okay? Now, the little hand is draw cards settings, okay? So if I want to set up how I'm going to draw cards, I can go to that one. The next one over is your view cards settings, which means can your players view cards? Uh, in the various decks that are there, okay? Um, discard pile settings, of course, can they view the discard pile? Can they interact with it, etc.? Now, what we've got, uh, you've got your Cosm decks and your Drama decks, okay? I'm not going to deal with those too much. I don't have Aurorsh, Pan Pacifica, or Tharkold yet, but uh, um, I will get those as soon as I possibly can. The rest of them, I've participated in all of the crowdfunding campaigns, uh, so I've done the best that I can with those. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and go up to the Destiny deck here. Now, notice I named it a Destiny deck. Well, everything is in alphabetical order here. If you look down the, the left-hand side of all these letters, you'll see it in alphabetical order. But then you go to the various Cosms and you have Isle Cosm, Isle Drama. Okay, so that's my Isle Cosm deck and my Isle Drama deck. And that's, you know, the players really don't need to deal with uh, the Drama decks at all, uh, nor should they deal with the Cosm decks. That's something that the, the GM should do, okay? So I'm going to stick with the Destiny deck, and we're going to start out with Draw Cards settings. Okay, when I pop open Draw Cards settings, all I get is a bunch of names of my players, and I get to determine who can mess with the Destiny cards. Okay, I'm going to set everybody up to be able to do that. Okay, so the Draw card settings means that they can draw cards for themselves. Okay, uh, and when they draw these cards for themselves, they are going to go into this area down here, and what your players see is is what goes in here. Now we're going to come back to this area in a little bit, and and I'll deal with it. But let's go ahead and go back to the deck settings. Okay, your view cards settings. I do want players to be able to view the cards. Uh, uh, in 
uh, in the decks themselves because there are certain means that allow players to do just that and they can select a card from there and and draw it to themselves now I, I actually think that they can only view the card they can't actually take it but we'll you know we'll get into that later this final one over here to the right is discard pile settings and it's much the same thing it just allows your your players to view the discard pile to see what's there um, but these discard piles, I found out, are viewable only by a specific player for their own discard. Okay, so that's pretty nice. Now, default player hand settings for all users. We're going to go to the global player hand settings. Now, as a GM, uh, I like to draw the cards to the hand uh, face up. Okay, they should all go to the hand face up. If they go to the table guess what they should also be face up because that means that they're moving from your their hand into their pool now I've got the card scale set at a 1.25 ratio I really don't want it at a 1.25 ratio because that will set my cards at like 417.5 by some other ridiculous number I want them to come up 250 by 350 and if players need to zoom in and look at them they can uh, I've got my my card color settings for player hand UI color, UI border color, and color applied to marked cards. Okay, now I changed mine here for the marked cards to blue. Okay, position settings. This position setting right here is only for this menu where you've got these cards down here at toward the lower left, toward the player listing. Alright, you need to leave that alone. 230 by 65 is perfect for, for most folks. Uh, on the on this um, canvas, uh, but if you do need to move it, you know you can moving it by five pixels could actually you know do something pretty rough. Um, now the the distance for horizontal position, it higher values are further to the right of the screen horizontally. Player hand vertical position higher values are further up the screen vertically so this 65 pixels comes from the bottom of the screen okay and then the 230 pixels for the setting on this is from the left side of the screen pushing it towards the right okay now uh, saving please note that changes to colors require a foundry refresh we're not doing any changes to colors, so I'm not going to worry about that too much okay so that's the card support unofficial uh, my hand of cards okay I've got it set to basically the same thing I don't want it at 1.25 I don't know if I set that there or what the deal is but you'll notice everything for uh, your player hand settings is the very same as your own hand settings Okay, you can change these things. For instance, if you don't want cards drawn to the table face up, you can uncheck this, and that would be okay. But I'm not going to worry about that for now. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, let's talk about the snitch setting. Chat message on player action. Prints a chat message when the players use the hotbar GUI to interact with decks to prevent cheating. So if you're worried about your players cheating, you can go ahead and select this and then your players will will not be able to to uh, do anything without you knowing about it in the system okay now um, I'm gonna draw some cards uh, I, I told you that we'd uh, we'd use this uh, setting permissions do I need to set any other permissions no as long as you have trusted players okay if your players are set to trusted they can do the things that I'm telling you they can do in in the decks okay it's it's kind of silly uh, that that they can't just do everything uh, but again Nork is working on that and there are certain games out there many games out there as a matter of fact that kind of require you to be vigilant as to what other players are doing Okay, opening card decks from the journal entry tab and the various buttons. Uh, this is something that's going to be important for you, so let's go ahead and take care of it. Let's go to the journal entry tab, and I have my decks listed right here. All right, so the big deal is that you want to be able to drag out a deck to the table to interact with it. Okay, say you're running a, a game. 
um, uh, and you want to use the Isle Drama deck, okay? You can literally drag this out to the table, and then you can go over to the left-hand menu over here where it says Tile Controls, and it looks like a three cubert blocks, okay? And then you can click on your your Isle deck to be able to do things with it. Okay, now when you right click, you come up with a bunch of little itty bitty uh, designs. These would show up better uh, in my basic dream time. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to my dream time and then I'm going to drag this deck back out. See how much larger it is here? Okay, now you'll notice that it doesn't have a background or anything like that. Uh, Nork is working on, on making it possible to do that. Okay, now you're going to have some bigger uh, icons here. So you can turn this deck now into an overhead tile. Okay, if I click this, um, it actually goes overhead. Let me take that off of overhead tile. It puts it in the foreground layer, which is above everything else. Okay. Um, so that if you if you noticed before, um, my player tokens were actually on top of that card deck. Well, this now shows up uh, above them, and I can blank that out anytime that I need to to allow my to be able to see what my players are doing with their tokens. Okay, but I don't want to do that right now. I actually want to get into the various menu items okay now if I want to I can deselect that as an overhead tile we can bring the deck to the front we can send it to the back okay we can also put it under foot so we can change the overhead tile to be under foot if we need to okay and then we go back and we can we can select it so that it's on top of all of the tokens again okay yeah, the drama deck's useless here. So I, I draw the Destiny deck instead. The Destiny deck allows me to draw some cards. Um, right now we've got it set underfoot. Of course, we can uh, put it as uh, foreground, okay? And then bring it about and shut that off and put it underfoot and everything like that. In order to interact with it, it has to be in the foreground, okay? But we can put it under our token's feet and and be good with that so now drawing cards this is an easy way to draw your cards but you don't have to do it this way uh, I'm gonna draw four cards I am not gonna draw with any replacements because that means that the the cards basically stay in the destiny deck but they also come to the table we don't want any copies like that. <clears throat> Are we going to draw them to the table? No, we need to be able to draw them to our hand. So when we take those cards, the cards pop up like so. Okay, step B, supporter. I have not gone through and programmed my cards. Okay, but I've got my, my four cards here. Obviously, if you're in the Nile Empire, you're going to need five. Okay, and you can get basically as many as you need down here. I will say this... It is being pushed for the official card system to have these be on a different layer altogether. So what I'm telling you now may be gone by the end of 2021. And I don't know if I'll shoot a new video or not, okay? Uh, at some point, I'm sure I'll have to. So here are my cards, okay? When you pop over them, they pop up. You can click them, click them to open, and they show you what the, the card says. Um, Let's see, can I zoom in? I'm not able to zoom in on this. Of course, your res the resolution that you use is going to help determine what size cards you're going to want to deal with, which is what over here in configure settings was so important about the, the, uh, the global player hand. You've got your card scale ratio right here. If I wanted to, I could set that to two and save and of course, it's going to require me to do a foundry refresh. So I'm, I'm not going to do a foundry refresh right now. But it would show double the size of the card. So instead of showing 250 by 350, it would be showing 500 by 700 for me. Okay. Now, the name of the card up here has, has not been changed. Nothing's been modified with it. But if you right-click, you have a menu that pops up. And it's, it calls to mark the card, 
which in this case is blue like I have in my settings. Okay, I'm going to unmark that card. Uh, I can reveal this card, which will pop it right open for everybody, and you can read it pretty readily there. Okay, and it, it even gives you warning messages that uh, you've popped open that card. Okay. The next thing is give to a player. If I wanted to give to a player, if I had any players in here, I could. Like if I needed to give step B to Andrew, I could. Um, this is how trades are best done. Okay, you give it to a player once the two of you have agreed on expending cards, whether it is from the hand or the pool, it doesn't matter. Um, once those cards are expended um, uh, and traded, you know, you give it to a player and they get the, the card that they asked for and they give you the card that you asked for. Okay. The next thing is editing the card macro. This allows you to pop up a new card macro. You can actually name the card here, step B. Okay, the scope is global, or, well, I guess you can't choose if it goes to chat. The scope is global, and it goes either through a script or a chat. So if somebody expends the card and it has a specific effect, it can literally affect the numbers in in the game okay right now uh the active effects are not too worried about that but i wouldn't doubt they're going to come along okay now so you've got a new dialogue title card obviously this title is going to change uh once you save it but we'll just go ahead and put in step b it tells you where the card is from um what the file name for the card is uh i'm not sure about the buttons but it gives you your height and your width um, and the render. Okay, can you add other commands to this? Certainly you can, but you're probably going to have to uh, program them in at this time. Okay, so now when I, I pop back over the card, you see step B is the title on that card. All right, flipping the card. If I flip the card, it's supposed to turn it around and it gives me the destiny uh, um, backing, which I put in there myself but it no longer gives the name of the card at the top okay I'd have to flip the card back and then you see step B all over again now discard GM's do not allow your players if they are discarding a card to either hit the delete key on their keyboard or to select delete from this menu it will get rid of the card completely and you will not be able to recover it if they need to discard a card, have them drag it to the desktop, uh, and that card will show up on whatever scene you are on at the time. Okay, you as the GM. Uh, or if if you trust them, you can just say, okay, just right-click on the card and click on disc discard. But do not allow them, your players, to hit the delete key for that card. It will get rid of the card. Now, obviously, when you go back and and uh, and uh, reset the deck to its original state, unshuffled with all cards, that's exactly what's going to happen. But if you end up running out of Destiny cards, or you end up running out of Drama cards, or Cosm cards, or anything and you try to shuffle things back in there, you're not going to be able to do it. And if you hit a reset deck, it's going to rip all of the cards from all of your players. And it's going to put them uh, back in there. Now, let me kind of downsize that for a minute so that I can go here. We've already looked at drawing cards. Okay, Looking at the discard, you can click to open to look at the discard. Right now, there's nothing in there. Okay, if I wanted to, I could discard everything, and you would see it there. Okay, but again, don't let your players hit delete or click on delete to get rid of a card, because that will send it to Oblivion instead of to your discard pile. Okay, and this sheet right here is your discard pile. Okay, uh, we've already been through the reset deck to its original state, unshuffled with all cards. Uh, right here, we've got shuffle. Okay, now say you've got a fresh deck that you've just reset, uh, but you want to shuffle it for your friends. So you click to shuffle it a couple of times and, and go that way. Now, to the best of my knowledge, 
if you shuffle a deck, it does not call back all of the cards that your players or you already have out. It only shuffles the card, or the ones that are in the discard, it only shuffles the ones that are presently in the deck. Okay? So we're not going to worry about shuffle. Viewing the deck, uh, this deck has 76 cards. Normally it has 80, but I have four of those cards where I'm sitting. So we're going to view the remaining 76 cards. Now, it's it's not huge. Uh, none of them are huge, but they tell you what is available. Okay? And they, they, they tell you what is and is not mixed. Okay? So if you start at the bottom, you've got card number 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six, seven, eight, and so on and so forth, okay? So th this Destiny deck has not yet been shuffled. Now, say your players have a card that allows them to, to pull one, okay? Um, they can either take a copy, okay, which for Torg I would not recommend. All of the cards are unique and should remain unique, okay? They can either take a copy for themselves, or they can just take the card itself by by clicking on this hand. I you know let's go ahead and grab that. We'll grab the drama and it places it in my hand right there. Okay. So that will um, that kind of expresses how that works. Now dealing to players, this bottom leftmost button down here. If you click that, you can deal cards to to your players. Okay. Um, say you want four cards, and uh, you're going it, you're going to have a list of players that are on for the night in here, and it asks you to deal with replacement. Okay, so what you can do is select the players that are online to be able to take cards. Okay, for say beginning an, a new act or a new scene, uh, they can grab onto those cards. Okay, I'm not going to deal cards to players. I don't have anybody online right now with me, so I'm not going to worry about that. All right, over on the right-hand side of the card deck over here, you can toggle the visibility state of the deck. Again, this is kind of similar to overhead tile, but overhead tile actually takes the tile up off of, of, the, uh, of the canvas and sets it on its own. Okay, now I've got this set on its own and I can move it around where I want and it still moves with my map. Okay, but I can move it around pretty much where I need it and then right click to open my menu over here. Now locking the deck, uh, I toggle a lock state for the deck. I don't even have the first clue what this is used for. Um, frankly, neither did Nork. Uh, last time I talked to him, he's probably figured it out by now, though. Um, anyway, there's a lot that's that's coming forward for all this. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that deck for now, and I'm going to switch back over to card pools. Now, let's say um, it's the end of my turn, and I want to be able to play a card. Okay, so I'm going to look at my cards. Let's say I'm playing Dogfight. Uh, I'm going to look at my cards, and I want to play one. Now, this is just how I've done things. I figured out all of the coordinates and everything like that, and I'm I'm willing to share not only the the uh, card pool page uh, with you as an XCF file out of GIMP, um, uh, but I am willing to share all of the coordinates with you as well for setting up your own scene. So, it's the end of round one, okay, and I'm thinking I'm going to take my drama card and I want to drag it out here, okay, you can see that it's small, it's 250 by 350, uh, and I can grab it, maybe, there we go, I can grab it and try and drag it over here and it almost fits, okay, if you want more exact coordinates, you can double left click to open up information on this, okay? So for my X coordinate, I want it to be 35. For my Y coordinate, uh, it's going to be 420. 
okay and that should place it pretty much right in that slot and then I see the width of 250 and the height of 350 those are both in there and they're in good shape now as an overhead tile uh, uh, in this particular instance uh, we can show these as overhead I don't recommend showing your pool cards as overhead okay um, but your occlusion mode you can have none it's always visible you can fade the entire tile tile you can make it into a roof which blocks vision and lighting until you move a token into a building or whatever which for the cards doesn't matter and then radial so surrounding the token um, uh, anything surrounding the token is is revealed okay um, but only surrounding the token and then animations I haven't even figured out loop videos and auto playing the videos and and all of that stuff yet okay so the basic stuff is right there for your coordinates I'm gonna update that tile see now here's an error that's going on that I think is really bad okay it wants me to choose a really weird freaking number okay and then it wants me to do the same thing for the X coordinate so 19.2 which doesn't make any sense I don't understand why I can't go with exact coordinates but as you can see it really doesn't have much of an effect on on the card okay now this is a really large board in here so your items are kind of really off okay um, in order to view that card uh, let's see you would actually have to zoom in to to see what's going on but then you can read it clear as day and if it's time to if it's time to get rid of it uh, I should be able to clear off that card okay uh, by let's see where's the discard let's see there you go there's the discard so if I'm done with it uh, or if you as the player are done with it you can click on the discard and voila it goes to the discard okay now if we go to if we go back over here and we look in discard okay are you sure oh, no 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 I don't want to discard the entire hand I need to interact with the deck okay and then I need to go to the discard pile there's my card right there alright I can take the card I can take a copy of the card I can burn that card to actually remove it from the deck remember everything can be restored later or I can return it to the top of the deck okay so the top of the the um, uh, destiny deck is where it would be returned and then the player could take it again uh, say they had a master plan okay now you'll notice that it's been moved out of my uh, my hand into my pool and then when I burned it out of my pool I discarded it okay so that's that's pretty cool now for you GM's um, this is a, a card deck that I set in here okay um, and again you can right click and you can draw a card we just want one we're gonna draw it to the table this time okay and it comes out to the table okay and then you can drag it to the current uh, uh, drama deck card mystical barrage is the nope we don't want to turn it I'll go over this in a moment we just want to zoom in mystical barrage any spells that deal damage gain plus one bonus die on a hit um, if you were doing a dramatic skill resolution steps a B and D would be available if this were a standard round the villains would go first but they would be stymied which means minus two to everything uh, to be able to to do anything and then the heroes would go if it were a dramatic um, uh, scene the heroes would go first but they would be facing a surge before the whole ball of wax gets started for their side and then the villains would go um, approved actions maneuver and taunt so if your players perform a maneuver or a taunt or one of each successfully um, they can gain uh, more cards for their hands now you saw a little bit ago the twisting of the card if you hold down your control key on your keyboard and you use your mouse wheel you can uh, you can angle that around now when if you angle it 
and then you double left click on the card you'll see that the rotation has changed from uh, 360 to 30 okay on that one but if I set things to rights and then I open it up again it goes back either to a rotation of 0 or of 360 okay now that's how all of that works okay I've already gone over using the bottom menu and all of that uh, though players can do certain limited things with their cards in their hands once a card is on the tabletop such as placing it into their pool you as the GM have to take over you have to manipulate it from there now like I said Nork is trying to figure out um, how to change permissions so that players can deal with their own things so let's get into building your world okay the first thing to note is take care with the name you plan to give your game world for one, this is the name your players and lurkers will know for the game, and two, that name also becomes your play directory or primary folder in your system for your asset library, which means you cannot change it once you've entered it. I've tried it. It comes out to be a mess. Now, uh, I'm, I am looking at my, uh, let's see, let me get back to Torg Recording. Okay, there we go. Um, I am looking at my game setup on the Forge, okay, and when I go to my assets library, you'll see that you you can only have one world in your folder, and I named mine Torg Test, okay, because I was using that to test the Torg game system, but now I can't change it. All of my assets are involved in that. So um, I could probably rename it if I wanted to. It says rename folder. Um, uh, I could try it, but I have a feeling that it's it's going to screw something up. Um, so I'm going to leave it alone. Okay. Now, don't worry. I'll go back and reset all of this stuff before my next game session with my players. Let's get a bit more specific now concerning world building. Every GM runs things in the way that is most comfortable and sensible to them. Some prefer to load their table up with all kinds of stuff, what we in the Foundry community call a canvas. So this area right in here, all of this is your canvas. Okay, even all of your menu items and stuff that are over here that you can kind of close down so that you can recover some, some space. Um all of this stuff is part of your canvas where you can paint your masterpiece as far as a game goes you can load it up with cards threats threat cards dice and character sheets all you want that's up to you however some of us prefer to keep a pristine and clean table as much as possible so when something is loaded onto my canvas it is readily available to the players and it can call their attention for example Let's say that I have a briefing that uh, I want to do a, a handout for, okay? So let's get my state of the war up. I've got my day one world map. I've got to go through and do a lot of updating on this. I tried to go through the um, uh, Near New Now's network, Near Now News Network from the Twitter feed from before the game was launched and something that's been kept up since then um, for my players so that they could see what was going on with the war and real life has just kept me from being able to do any of that uh, besides the text here is really small it's hard to read um, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to attempt to change that sometime in the near future um, however say I want to show that to my players so I can go up here to the top and I can click on show players showed the text content of state of the war to all players so if I had a briefing or something like that I could show that to my players right away but it's clutter it's all over the table okay if if I don't have a whole lot of things going on my players can immediately uh, access they, they see this pop up and they go oh something for me to read okay so let's read it um, but I don't use threat cards because they clutter up the table. I don't use, you know, I, I put together all of my own bad guys. So let me go over to the, the actors and I'll look at opposition. L let's go with cyber papacy. We've got a cyber knight chess. Okay, he's for an upcoming adventure that I'm building. And I can go through his, his basic NPC sheet. Okay, 
Now that's not cool. Why are wounds and shock and possibilities not showing up underneath his name? I'll have to bring that up. Okay, perks and abilities. Uh, he has endurance, which gives him a plus two shock limit. He has cyberware implants. And if I go to, to edit what I've got there, I did not list his cyberware implants on there, but they are listed uh, in, in other places. Uh, close, please. Why is that not closing? Okay, that, uh oh, that's really not closing. Uh, okay, so every so often things are going to get stuck and you may have to reload the page. So I'm going to reload the page right now and, uh, and I'll get logged back in and we'll, we'll take a look again. Uh, I don't know why it freezes up like that. Uh, it's something that, uh, I believe they're, uh, the, uh, the powers that be are working on to get that taken care of. So Cyber Papsy, let's open up chess again. All right, and we'll kind of drag him out and see how how friendly this is. You've got all of his basic stats here. Uh, anything that that uh, can generate a, a, a dice roll. Uh, see, now things are moved where they're supposed to be. Okay, wound, shock, possibilities, cyber knight chess. Okay, perks and abilities. You've got endurance. That's your plus two shock limit. You've got your cyberware implants. We went over that. Uh, he's got the double tap perk. And he's got hard to kill. Now, when I go to install the uh, core book for for this, all of the weapons, armor, and gear, cybernetics, um, uh, everything like that that comes with the core book is available once you've purchased it. Now, you got to purchase it. Okay, but once you purchased it, all of that stuff is available and the active effects are already done for it to the best of my knowledge. Okay, gear, I've got his gear laid out here. Okay, Every, not everything has a, uh, an icon to it, but I've got his, his cyber deck, smart gun attachment, trigon body plating, etc., etc., for all of the all of the cyberware that he is carrying in his body powers he doesn't have any powers powers are going to be your um that's your psionic abilities that's your magic spells that's your miracles um the uh i still haven't been able to get through to get the pulp powers put on here but since pulp powers work more like perks and abilities than powers, they'll probably remain perks and abilities only. Now your effects, you can add effects in here, okay? But the best way to add effects is to put them in equipment and and uh, and then drag them over from the items list onto the onto the record sheet. Background, uh oh, his background disappeared. I had his background on here, uh, but it disappeared. I'll have to, I, I've also got him listed in a journal entry. So, all right, so that's, that's that guy. Okay, and it shows you opposition and whatnot uh, and how that works. Uh, let's see. So if you want threats all over the table and stuff like that, you can do it. I, I have this basic setup page right here with all of my characters with all of my players characters and my NPCs and stuff like that more of which are going to have to be moved from roll 20 to here but uh, eventually they'll be done all right uh, let's see many GMs fall between the two extents of having a messy canvas or a clean canvas okay um, but I've laid out the reasons that I like to keep a clean canvas if possible uh, I want to be able to bring things to my players attention as quickly as possible so that they don't have to thumb through everything and and look it all up but I have tons of information on my journal entry tab uh, for the various storm nights uh, Captain Mo Gonzalez uh, let's see I can open up various records that he's got, uh, his uh, experience points, glory, deeds, and connections, which are not covered on the character sheet, okay? I like to keep really, really good records, okay? I even have my own GM notes about a lot of stuff uh, that is using the GM notes uh, module that is out there. Um, I keep this information for myself specifically so that I can go back and, and look on the record, okay? So let's close that. 
but like Mo here has been in all seven of our adventures. We're currently in Adventure 7, and obviously things are going to change a little bit when when we get there, uh, which reminds me I need to go through and update experience points for these guys because they just got ten more uh, because Act 2 was really expensive. Okay, Act 2 took a lot of time to do. So, anyway, experience record, his glory record, uh, what adventure it happened in, when and what happened. Um, he has had one, two, three, four, five glory episodes in seven adventures. Two of them in the same, or I'm sorry, four of them in two adventures. So, you know, the glory doesn't come very often, but when it comes, it's pretty, pretty cool. You can also do deeds completed, so if they've completed some kind of a special deed or something that may give them recognition, you can put that in there. Now, none of this stuff that I'm showing you right now is actually in the uh, Tor game system. It's for you to develop on your own, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot more time on it. Uh, I've got an experience track that I set up for these guys. Um, uh, this is Mo's basic look and description and everything like that. We keep bandying about how, how much he, he weighs. Uh, we keep saying 700 pounds or 900 pounds. He's only 450 pounds, but at seven feet tall, that's a lot of muscle, uh, to be, to be thrown around. Okay. Uh, Mo's ability record, uh, his attribute limits, the languages he speaks, uh, natural weapons uh, and his outsider they call it a, a, a racial perk it's it's not uh, it's not really that great now because he is an outsider from the living land I, I've put it as minus four persuasion tests with non adenos I ought to put that into an active effect quite frankly okay and then if we run into adenos it can temporarily be removed but since he transformed into a Nile rocket ranger um, his outsider is only a penalty of two instead of four because rocket rangers are really looked up to and and uh pretty famous and everything like that okay so anyway i did extra special work to to uh for for my storm knights i love to do it for my players and and we tend to have a lot of fun with it combat tracker i'm not really going to discuss the combat tracker too much uh i i've never used the combat tracker where where is that thing at is that it Okay, combat tracker right there. We don't have an active encounter going right now, uh, but uh, if you look at the combat tracker for, uh, you know, for pretty much any foundry game, you're going to find out that uh, uh, when you roll initiative, your player tokens are lined up on the combat tracker here. Um, uh, and then as they complete... A, an action or series of actions uh, they can be marked as completed and they go to the bottom of the of the row well Torg doesn't do things like that Torg has a very nebulous initiative so it's the good guy it's the it's the villains or it's the heroes okay well Erwan uh, who whom many of you may know as Ruano um, went through and rebuilt the tracker initially so that you could have one side going first and then you could switch it over to the other side you could shuffle your tokens um, uh, you could show various effects and whatnot of the of the tokens well GM Matt had to go through recently and fix a bunch of stuff because um, 0 0.7 point10 becoming 0 0.8 point whatever uh, kind of screwed up a whole lot of stuff in the combat tracker. But they finally got it figured out, so if you want to use the combat tracker, there you go. I may use it in the future. I may even use it in the near future because there's a big nasty combat coming up for my players. Uh, let's see. Setting up tokens uh, and maps and stuff for non-player characters um, and how much of what you need in Foundry is already ready to go and their use can be found in other videos. A lot of that stuff can already be found for setting up uh, your your good guys, bad guys, etc. Um, so I, I'm going to go over, I'm going to touch on a couple of things. Let's use my buddy Claws here. If you double left click on Claws, you're going to see the character record pop up. Okay, and it, it's beautiful, but for whatever reason, I don't have the background. I don't know why. Anyway, uh, I went over much of this in the other video. 
okay so you really don't have to fight with it all that much um, uh, go back to the other video and watch that uh, but this is set up a lot more compartmentalized than the non-player character or opponent sheet um, uh, the threat sheet if you will so players can go through and look very easily and see stuff um, uh, they cannot always roll for everything that's there but if something is rollable uh, you've got your d20 right here for your attack roll uh, or you know defensive rolls or anything like that the problem is bonus dice were pretty much removed to the um, to the chat area uh, so when you make an attack you can click to get a bonus die out of it which makes a lot of sense because then that means that you don't have to keep your character sheet here open okay but you'll notice spells miracles and powers on the power sheet uh, or powers tab okay active effects again uh, these active effects can fill up very quickly with what you need to to be able to fill them up with okay background and notes now I've covered a lot of that stuff so let's deal with maps um, and and some of the some of the other things uh, uh, Matt Richie wanted me to go over these things so I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on each one real quick we're gonna switch over to the Amberdale Carnival here and then uh, we're gonna right click to configure the scene off of this tab now you can get the configuration here and that's not a problem or you can also go to the scenes tab open up nights before Christmas here's your Amberdale carnival right click there and click configure there are a few things you can do uh, on your scenes tab that you can't do from your your uh, scenes tab up here but uh, you can choose what cause them uh, the the scene is taking place in okay uh, it is not alphabetical in nature so you'll actually have to read it you can determine if it is a pure dominant or mixed zone if it is say a pure zone or I'm sorry no a dominant zone okay it's going to give you a secondary cosm okay so you can have a mixed cosm let's go Isle Living Land okay and let's see what that did to my see I've got my living land information right here yes that's right you if you go over the uh, icon that appears on your scene it will pop up the card that goes with um, with all of your axioms and everything like that do the same thing for aisle and it pops up okay all of this stuff was approved by um, for use by Ulysses Spieler okay now our zone is actually a mixed uh, a mixed zone for uh, aisle okay it's it's a mixed aisle zone uh, or is it pure yeah okay pure actually gets rid of it. so I guess it's a pure zone um, although I wanted it to be represented as mixed okay yeah it does not automatically pop that up again okay details and dimensions um, if you want the accessibility to be GM only you can uh, you can also show it to all of your players if you put it into navigation it goes up here this is your navigation bar up here across the top okay um, if you want to take that out of navigation you can deselect that and the Amberdale Carnival should have disappeared so let's see something here configure well now I can toggle navigation right so toggle navigation it still did oh it didn't send Amberdale Carnival away because I'm still in it so toggle navigation and there you go it goes away the Amberdale Carnival so that was the big deal there okay continuing to configure you can set your scene dimensions you can set um, everything your background color your grid configuration everything that you want to set up okay now Matt wanted me to touch on dimensions okay so here's the deal um, your grid type is a square 
okay, for pretty much anything that you're going to do in Torg unless you've got a better way of, of dealing with gridless or hexagons, okay, and, and I'll leave that up to you. I'm not even going to try, okay. The grid size is set at 70. I have mine set at 70 because that's what I used on roll 20. Okay. Now, for the carnival, each of the squares is actually 3 meters. Okay. You can set your unit to whatever you want it to be. Okay. But what this is going to do is it's going to take each grid square that you've got and it's going to measure from that grid square to wherever you go. And it's going to measure it in the unit you want it put in. And it's going to measure it for the distance for each unit. Okay? So if I've got a distance of 3 meters, okay, and let me go ahead and save these changes and get over to the Amberdale Carnival. And I'll get my measuring tool out. If each one of these is 3 meters, okay, going from center to center is 3 meters. Now, let's go ahead and make things dark. Why not? And we'll go back up here. So, as your lights come on, uh, you can you can mess with your various lighting, and it's really not that hard to do. Uh, there's my light bulb. They changed it. Okay. So, the light type is local. Uh, local light unrestricted, global light, and universal light. Um, uh, you can set up your lights the best that, that you can, uh, that you like. And then you've got your dim light radius, your bright light radius, and your emission angle. Now, your emission angle is going to be based on your light rotation angle. Now, if you'll look, okay, I'm looking at this one right here, okay. My light emission angle is 145 degrees, so from here around to here, okay. But my light rotation angle is zeroed out. That means south, okay. If I wanted to, I could, let's see, let's do 127 and see what it did with my light. Okay, if I wanted to broaden the light out, I could to say 210 or whatever. Now, you're wondering why I'm getting stoppage at certain points. That's because of walls. Okay, and you can see the walls right here that I put up. Yes, they're kind of messy. Don't care. Don't really care. All right, so enough fun with that. Let's go ahead and go back over to lights, make it daylight. <coughs> and you'll notice that it brightens up at a certain rate of speed and a certain illumination. And you can set all of that stuff in the game itself. All right, uh, how to set token properties for wounds and shock. Okay, so let's do, I'm going to double click and get Cret open. I did move him over to a regular character sheet. Uh, like I was supposed to, um, but let me go ahead and kind of crush that down just a little bit. I'll move, wait a minute, oop, I'm in measure and I don't want to be in measure. I'm going to move Cret over here, okay, and we'll go ahead and pop his sheet back open, okay. Now you'll notice you've got your bars up here, okay, Cret has two wounds, he only has two, as you can see right here, and he's taken one of those. You'll see his shock is on the bottom though, okay? He can take up to nine shock points, and if you count these squares, you're going to see that there's nine of them. And as they get hit, they turn orange or yellow or whatever. I'm sure that you can change the, the color somewhere. I just don't know where to do it. Now, if you want to set your token properties for wounds and shock, you're going to single left click to select the character, then right click. Then you're going to go to your settings uh, cog that you've got right there and you can see all kinds of information here you know who the character is and who they represent um, when does the name get displayed does it get displayed when it's controlled when it's hovered always for everyone etc uh, linking actor data this is a unique actor a player actor so you want to keep that uh, data linked now Say you had a whole swarm of rats, about a thousand rats, um, you would not want to link the actor data on there. Each time you pull one of those rats out, it's going to have its own set of statistics and everything like that automatically. It's just going to be there. Okay. 
uh, the image. You've already got the image, which is this uh, this one right here. Okay. Uh, their position on the table, not really terribly important. However, if you've got a token like this that you don't want to spin around in place, you're going to need to lock rotation. Okay? And you can disable the direction indicator for your bad guys if you want them to completely disappear, become invisible, etc. Okay? Um, vision. Does the token have vision? Yes, you're... you're my recommendation is leave the defaults unless you have something super special going on. Okay. Finally, you've got your resources. The display bars are hovered by anyone. Can you build more bars? Yes. If you know how to program. Okay. In this case, we have shock and we have wounds. Those are really the only two that you need to have. Uh, any possibilities that you go to expend are going to actually be shown over here. Okay, you've got your possibilities down here. Now, many of these can only be controlled by the GM and the player, I believe. So if, they, if you go to add a possibility, you can click on the plus symbol. And that is supposed to add a possibility. Let it get caught up. Oh, plus... Anyway, it's supposed to modify on, on the character sheet, and it's supposed to modify here as well. Okay, and then when, uh, uh, when one is expended, it is, it is just zeroed out. Okay, now you'll see that my players are all set up for the next act to begin with either three or four possibilities each going on. Okay, uh, let's see... Okay, you might want to organize your your compendiums and your journal entries and everything like that. Is it a good idea to keep everything from Torg in your journal entries? No, because it's not only you that has to worry about how they load on your computer, but your players also have to worry about how things are loaded on their computers. Okay, so if you move something over to the compendium, you can still access it. Okay, um... Uh, but it'll be in a compendium. It doesn't have to load everything up at that point, but it will load when it needs to, okay? As for your journal entries and stuff like that, you'll see that I have a lot of information. I've got additional characters, additional sheet templates. I've got all this information because I find it necessary to run the game. However, I need to go through and learn how to use my... Uh, uh, my compendiums so that not everything is loaded all the time. If I've got a bad guy that I don't need to have for a while or ever again, I can move it over into my compendium and still have it available just in case. Okay, and then I can export my compendiums and if I start up a new game and I need to get some old bad guys back, I can reload the compendium into the new game and voila, there you go. Okay, but as you can see, I've got tons and tons and tons and tons of work, adventure archives, and uh, you know the various adventures that my players have had, things that have not been put into place yet. I've got my reliquary where I can deal with abilities and adventures and the Infiniverse, which I was I, I still intend to get moving, even though I know. Um, uh, Ulysses Spiel wants to do an inf uh, an Infiniverse sort of deal. Okay. Uh, let's see. How far are we into this video? We're getting pretty heavy on time, so I'm thinking I'm gonna I'm gonna move this along as quick as possible. Um, so your organization is up to you to perform. I like to be hyper organized. Period. I don't see any reason that I should not be hyper-organized. Uh, it allows my players to have access to the things that they need to have access to when they need to have access to it. And I try not to overload things. Um, let's see. Creating and using threats. Uh, I showed you the threat sheet a bit earlier. Uh, let's go ahead and, uh, and open a different threat. Let's go with, let's see, do I have anything? No. Core game. Uh, I don't have anything in the core game either. My opposition archive. Let's go to that. Core game archive. I've got a uh, first planning Gosbog. Okay, here is your here is your uh, threat sheet and how things work in it. Okay. 
when you're going to set up a threat okay you can do this edit button over here and what that does is that loads in your attributes your skills whether the skills are favored or not the stars are for favored um, uh, what your base movement is for that character their toughness and any possibility potential they may have okay most of your bad guys are not going to have possibility potential now as you edit these things down here your items up here uh, start to get filled out and okay so um, you got your special abilities now the special abilities pop up on here when you start pulling things over from your items okay for instance uh, NPC only fear okay follower opposition special abilities uh, I've got all of mine filled out but I need to go back and kind of redo the um, uh, the active effects on these so that they can actually modify statistics within the the threat sheet itself okay um, but here's fear right here it's the very same thing I've dragged over here I have all of my information in here uh, where the rule comes from in the core book etc okay um, and so once you've dragged that on it actually becomes part of your stats okay uh, I've got bite and claws there's fear I don't know why that's not spaced out but uh, then you've got mindless relentless undead and of course you know it, it has a description down here Gosbog of the first planning are corpses of any race though most technically human entwined with rotting vegetation and putrid flesh da -da -da -da. <clears throat> this is how you create your your Gosbog okay and you can go through and add background and notes uh, your active effects if you have effects that are very specific to that creature and cannot be dragged over from your items list then you you know you create them and they become a part of that creature okay powers this creature has no powers if you have say a mystery man from the Nile Empire um, their powers are not going to go here either because remember what I said earlier pulp powers are all about your um, uh, those are your perks and abilities more than any kind of real actual power so your spells your miracles and your psionics are going to go into the powers tab those are actual powers okay gear um, now I built a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, uh, strength damage weapon specific to the Gosbog. the reason being because there is still no attack for hand-to-hand -hand only okay you can roll your melee weapons but it's not going to do you a whole lot of good okay now this one still has the bonus die on it for the bonus roll um, I'm not sure that you actually need that if you've got the attack roll the bonus die should set up on the hand-to-hand -hand. okay folks that's that's it for setting up your own threat it's really not that hard to do okay uh, how to use dice in the game, particularly bonus die rolls. Now, typically, uh, let's get a. Uh, let, I'm going to move Crep back to where he belongs, but I'm going to open his sheet and we're going to get a roll. Okay. Let's look at one of his attacks. Let's go with bite and claws. Okay. So you'll notice that under bite and claws, you have the attack roll and you have the bonus die roll. But if I roll the attack for him okay I got a total of 11 on my 3d dice action total of 11 damage is 8 okay so let's see something strength plus 2 damage well Kret's strength is 6 so 6 plus 2 is 8 so it works <coughs> all of this stuff is figured in now so all of it should work so the die total that I got the die roll that I got was an 11 okay that's what shows up down here and it gives you very specific numbers as to what to use okay if the 10 or the 20 had tripped up then uh, it would have been a higher dice roll and it would have given you an opportunity for more bonus die now the action total was 11 let's say the um, the melee um, yeah the, the melee defense uh, of the target was a 10 okay so I'm gonna hit but I'm not gonna get any bonus dice out of it but 
let's say I want to add a possibility. I could roll and add a possibility by just by clicking on possibility. When I do that, it's going to add to that number, but it's also going to gray out possibility. Okay. Now you're up. You can only have one possibility in a turn. You can have one up in a turn. You can use one hero card. You can use one drama card. Okay. You can use one of each of those four. And if you get a plus three card, you can click on that and add that plus three. Now we come down to damage. Let's say that I got a 16 for my action total. That gives me one bonus die of damage. I can go over here to BD, or I could go down here to my Bite and Claws, and I could make that bonus roll. If you make it from here, ta-da! Okay, so your action total was an 11. Your new damage is a 10 because you rolled a plus 2 bonus down here. Okay? That's it. That's the whole kit and caboodle. Why the picture is still not working, I'm not sure. We're, we're going to have to figure that out. Okay? But that's how you use the dice. Now, um, if you wanted to be able to roll a bonus die uh, on your own, okay, there is a there is a macro that you can create. I named mine bonus dice. I'm going to pop that open. And the command is, it, and this would go to chat instead of script, and it's all global, okay? You can roll 1d6 with a maximum, uh, which explodes on sixes, but give, each die gives a maximum of five, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and roll one of those. That's my bonus die, and it throws it right there. That gave me a max of five, okay? Now, if I rolled a six and then a four, my actual bonus damage would only be nine, because remember, your six is actually an infinity symbol, and it does not count as an actual six, okay? Does not count as an actual six. So the, the bonus damage on that would only actually be a 9. And we could sit here and, and play with it all night long. There's a 6 right there, and there's a 5, okay? Look at what it came up with. It only came up with a 10, okay? Because you got a 6, which is downgraded to a 5, and then it rolled a 5 on top of that. So total uh, bonus dice of 10, bonus die damage, okay? Uh, let's see. We're getting to the end here, folks. Active effects. Um, I'm still getting a handle on these. Uh, they're becoming a very powerful addition to Foundry uh, Virtual Tabletop in general and Torg in specific. There are a lot of effects in Torg that can be readily handled by active effects. The problem is, as a GM, you're responsible for programming those yourself. Um, so my recommendation is find videos about active effects and how to program them and you can start programming your own stuff. Now, the stuff that comes out from Matt and the gang for Ulysses Spiele to put on sale on the Infiniverse Exchange for use in Foundry VTT, um, that stuff should be set up perfectly because Matt and Erwan and the gang you know, understand act, how active effects work a whole lot better than I do. Okay, that brings us to the end of this video. I have covered everything that I've been asked to cover. Uh, I've covered the things from the first video that needed to be expanded upon for the GMs, and uh, that's, that's about it. We're gonna uh, call it a night and hope that you guys have been able to enjoy this. Uh, I know it's a really long video, but uh, it's good for you. It builds character. All right. And so it is time to head out. And so good night, my friends. And if you have any questions, put them into, uh, put them into the chat below, uh, and we'll talk more about it. Bye now.